want to help today to uh, get get you oriented as to uh, one of the biggies that we have is a lot of bottled water use in this country. Uh, tap water is the healthiest drink. So we do want to talk about water that's safe to drink versus bottled water and why there's a difference. I also want to be able to share with you the importance of how to share with your patients the importance of oral health and fluoride. Uh, I'd like you also to be able to address this fluoridation's impact and water, community water fluoridation will be abbreviated as CWF throughout this presentation and how water fluoridation impacts dental disease without a cognizant change in your, your behavior whatsoever. It's one of those things that you just passively do. And also to be able to address how much fluoride you have in your water. Uh, you're a highly fluoridated state uh, which we'll go through, but you also have areas that are naturally fluoridated. You may not be in a fluoridated community, but you also are receiving fluoride in the water because it's a natural mineral that is found in uh, groundwater that comes up through and erodes rocks and comes through the soil, it picks up fluoride. Next, please. So I wanna go through first safe drinking water. Uh, bottled water versus tap water, and we'll compare those two. Next. Bottled water is something that I was, I'm not a fan of, first of all, because most of it does not have fluoride uh, in it. It's non, pretty much non-detectable, although some can have a lot. Uh, there are some concerns that with uh, fluoridated water, or excuse me, uh, bottled water, it's not regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency like the EPA regulates drinking water. Uh, it's, just, it's considered a food, so it's regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. They don't have the same strict controls over which tap water does. Um, if you read their website, you would think it's, one, it's on par, but frankly, it's not. Now, the precautions that the EPA has on fluoridated bottled water, excuse me, bottled water, the EPA says, caution on it, that some people may wish to take special precautions with water that they drink, in particular, people with immune systems that are weakened by AIDS, chemotherapy, or transplant medications. They're more vulnerable to the microbial contaminants in drinking water, such as cryptosporium. Uh, that's in bottled water. That's not in tap water. So with that statement, they're making a huge remark that people need to be aware of because you can get very, very ill with bottled water. That's not something that we always hear. It's something that physicians do not always uh, uh, convey. Next, please. Bottled water, there's a few concerns again. There are a lot of people that distrust tap water. And you think about it when we go visit other countries, like if we go to Mexico and getting uh, getting our dysentery, <laughs> uh, that's not fun. So we are told not to drink the water. Well, folks coming from those countries are also told don't drink the water. They don't drink their tap water. They may cook with it, but a lot of folks drink tap water, or excuse me, drink bottled water instead. It, bottled water is perceived as more pure by many folks than tap water. And just think about the big mess we have with bottled water, tossing it away, land, land, landfill nightmares. Uh, there is a actual estimate that by 2055, there'll be more plastic bottles in the ocean than there will be fish. And that's uh, it's not just some far-fetched idea. Um, they don't have any requirement in this country to list how much fluoride's on the bottle. Other countries, Canada, Europe, a lot of places that uh, that you see, they list it right on the bottle. For some reason, the FDA does not do that. Now, I do have some notes uh, here on the side that you can where you can find the fluoride content in water and what else is in it. It's on a website, IBWA, International Bottled Water Association, and the second reference is to actual fluoride in bottled water. So you can get fluoridated bottled water if you're in an area that doesn't have fluoridated water. However, one thing to keep in mind besides what was on that last slide of the infections that you might pick up if you're uh, immunocompromised, Kroger had bottled baby water a few years ago that actually had mold growing in it. And a parent discovered that when they 
baby didn't really want to drink and it was a nasty taste and they looked at it and smelled it kroger had what bottled water that has mold in it have you ever ever heard of tap water having mold in it no you don't it is it is totally it is strictly controlled by the environmental protection agency and that's a great thing next please our water is the purest water available on the planet period in this country we are very very lucky and again the epa has strict, strict testing requirements all the way from the top to the bottom to water plants that it has to be at certain levels of, of drinkability. It cannot be uh, throwing out a lot of bacteria. That's why you get chlorine in it, whether we like the smell of it or not, certain times of the year here in Florida uh, with the heat that we get and a lot of bulk, uh, bacteria growing in the water, we get a lot of, of chlorine or chloramine added. Um, that's just one of the things we put up with. It is constantly monitored for impurities. Now, I, and contaminants is the word that's used for anything that's in water. Smell, uh, cloudiness, uh, fluoride, um, copper, anything that's in water is contaminant. H2O is the only thing that water is supposed to be. So anything else that's in it is a scary word, contaminants. You'll hear that from people who oppose fluoridation saying it's a contaminant. Uh, it's just the words that the EPA use. There is hesitancy, again, uh, amongst groups of folks that come from other countries that they will drink tap water. And when you talk to them about drinking, excuse me, they will drink bottled water. And when you talk to them about drinking tap water, they're like, no, no, it's not as good. And you explain that this contains no controls over it as far as strict bacterial counts that the tap water does. Plus tap water for you in North Dakota is almost always fluoridated to the appropriate amount to help reduce cavities. So we have to do education with our patients to help them understand that tap water is better for them. Next, please. Fluorides, whether topical or community water fluoridation helps prevent the disease for which our profession began. Next. Water fluoridation is nature's way of preventing cavities. We found out about it. The next slide will show in, in a minute about the history of water fluoridation. It wasn't something that we stumbled upon. It was actually one of those scientific accidental findings that we studied, looked at, reevaluated, found out what was causing folks to not have as many cavities in certain areas of the country, and then replicated it in 1945 in a study that took, uh, took on a major role in uh, reducing dental decay, cavities and caries is all the same words we know. And now where we have almost, uh, almost three out of every four people in the U.S. that are on community water systems have fluoridated water daily. Now, just having exposure, being in an area where it has fluoridated water will reduce cavities by at least 25%. And this is very important that it is adults that benefit as much or more than children over their lifetimes. And I kind of say that this is not an unsurprising uh, finding because we're adults longer than we are children. Children definitely benefit a great deal. They do. But our entire life, by the time we we're in, in our uh, adult years, 90% of us have had cavities. That's a huge number of people. It's water, fluoride is found basically in all water. Again, it's picked up from rocks as it erodes them. Um, it's in, it's in uh, lakes, rivers, groundwater, the ocean. Uh, the optimal level that the, it has been set for being in water is 0 0.7 milligrams per liter, which is the same as parts per million. Next slide, please. This was a slide I was talking about. This is on the NICDR website. Uh, they even have one on the CDC's website, they've just overhauled, which I'll uh, need to update this slide with <laughs> and show you, but it is on the website and it's phenomenal. Just shows the history, how we found out about it, the work that was done to discover what was causing these teeth to have less cavities in 1901 with some brown stains and then other areas having almost no cavities with no stains on their teeth. A fluoride probe was invented in 1930 and that's when they were able to measure fluoride in the waters of those areas. And they found that 
at one part per million that the teeth had very few cavities and they looked good. There were no brown stains of any sort on the teeth. We stumbled upon it by accident. Next, please. Now, you all are leading the nation in the amount of people in your state that are fluoridated. You're number five in the US. That's impressive. Over nine, almost 97% of your residents receive fluoridated water. That's impressive. Now, the Healthy People 2020 goal that was set, uh, or 2030 goal that was set for water fluoridation in the US is to get every community and every state up to 77.1%. Again, you're at 96.5%. That's phenomenal. The only downside to this, and the reason why our group, American Fluoridation Society, is working with the oral health uh, department, uh, Sherry Kiefer and group, is that you are a prime target for those that are opposing fluoridation. And they are in the state, and they are the ones that like to hit small towns because they can try and influence the decision makers. Once they do that, the next thing you know is there's a vote on fluoridation many times without anyone knowing about it, and it's voted out. And it's much tougher to get it back in once it's voted out. So this is we're going over this information to help you be vigilant and to kind of be our ears and eyes and the state's ears and eyes on your community that's fluoridated to keep it that way. Next, please. Topical fluoride as well as fluoridated water are both needed. The CDC and many, many others have said that you do need both forms. Toothpaste alone with fluoride does not take care of all of your cavity fighting needs. It reduces them. It reduces them a great amount, almost a 25% reduction. But when you add fluoridated water on top of it, you get another 25% reduction in cavities. Again, we're taking this disease and we're reducing it and reducing it. We want it gone, but we can't do it without having the proper tools, not just fluoridation, but diet, availability to dental care, um, education on hygiene. It's multifactorial, the dental decay is, but fluoridation is a very passive way to knock out a ton of cavities. It's just like with seat belts. When seat belts were in place, well, airbags came out, we didn't stop wearing seat belts. You need both of them, they're additive. Next, please. Dental cavities are a huge, devastating disease process, as we know. It is the most common chronic disease for children and teenagers, way more than asthma, obesity, and diabetes. Now, you would think that. Who would think it? I surely didn't think it was the most common chronic disease, but it is. It is an infectious and transmissible disease. We give our bacteria to others. When our babies are born, they're not born with a mouthful of oral flora of bacteria. When we kiss our babies, when they talk and chew on toys with other kids, kiss baby um, daycare folks and parents, we're transmitting our bacteria to them. And if we're, our mouths are more full of uh, bacteria that causes cavities, then their mouths are going to populate with it. Cavities are so awful, so awful, and even can cause death. These two folks on the right, this one gentleman in the middle, Diamante Driver from Maryland, was one that made uh, national news back in 2007 when he died of an abscess tooth that went to a brain abscess and he died from it. The other one to the right is a truck driver from Russia that was living here with his family and he died of an abscess tooth. Just horrible. It causes pain. People miss work by it. Kids can't learn in school. It is a predictor of cavities later in life when you have them in your, in your primary baby teeth. And it also, if you think about it, if you've had ever had a cavity with that is causing you pain, you, and I have, it is difficult to concentrate. Pain is an overpowering, um, um, overpowering force in our lives. And it's something that we need to prevent from an, our dental, uh, dental prevention standpoint. Next, please. Well, it's taken a while, but medicine, and this includes my daughters who are in medicine, the head has really become connected to the body. We knew it, 
that medical folks had finally started to wrap their heads around it. That young lady I had on the last slide on the, on the right in this picture, she's not been beaten. And those of you that have seen kids like this, you know that she has an abscess too. And that abscess has moved into her facial muscles and facial planes, and she has a cellulitis present. That area, when the eye starts to close, it does not take long for that infection to go through the plexus of veins that are backwards into the brain because there are not valves in that plexus of veins. They get a brain abscess, septicemia, and they can be dead within 24 hours. There's also strong evidence or a um, causal link between periodontal disease and diabetes, obesity is affected by it, coronary artery disease, and we know subacute bacterial endocarditis is, is related to oral bacteria. Uh, metabolic syndrome, pregnancy, preterm babies, tons of things that we're finding that are going to continue to list is going to continue to grow as we relate what goes on in the mouth of the rest of the body's body. Next, please. I kind of gave you a little background in that information, and I want to jump into clinical cases. My clinical cases are not exactly like clinical cases that a practitioner will be giving you. This is more around what we see uh, from the standpoint of fluorides in preventing cavities and the impacts that it have that it has on our tooth decay and our uh, health and well-being and quality of life. In this first clinical case, next please. I want to cover water fluoridation. What happens when you stop it? Its impact on early childhood caries and then sources of information on sign fictitious claims. This is what could happen in your state easily as it's happened in the one community that I'm going to show you where you have it, it gets voted out. It's never about science. It is never about science. These decisions are made by elected officials or water boards or commission, health commissions. It's not scientifically based. It is typically political, but politically based. Next slide, please. First, I want to talk about cessation effects. Next. What happens when you stop fluoridation? Does do things continue to go on okay because you have fluoride toothpaste that you're using or fluoride mouth rinses or fluoride varnishes in the office? Well, let's take a look at it. Next, please. Let's take a look at two communities in Canada. These communities, Cal Calgary, Alberta, and Edmonton, Alberta, are located about 90 miles apart, and both of them are fluoridated. A study was being done monitoring kids in second grades, how many had cavities over time, and it started back in around 2004, 2005. Next slide. And this was showing the percent of kids who had at least one cavity. Lindsay McLaren is the researcher that did all of these studies. We get up to about 2009, 2010, and then the city council decides, hmm, we're going to stop fluoridation. Just for no good reason. But they had good reasoning. What was wrong? Next, please. Now you can see the parallel. Edmonton actually is not as an affluent of an area as Calgary. So Calgary's cavity levels were lower, but nonetheless, they were on somewhat of a parallel until 2011. In 2014, 13, 14, when Dr. McLaren did another study, it showed that there was an exponential rise after fluoridation ended. It was about 146% jump. In Florida, in cavities in these kids. Next slide, please. Edmonton has been fluoridated the entire time. When Calgary stopped between the 2013 14 data that Dr. McLaren had until their latest study came out in 2018 2019, Calgary has now surpassed Edmonton, which is still fluoridated, and Calgary is actually rising while Edmonton saw a decrease. Now they are 10 points above at 65% of the kids who had at least one cavity in second grade versus Edmonton. And there's no reason to think that it's not going to continue to rise. They had a really wonderful campaign. Thankfully, uh, AFS was able to be a part of helping them. And they voted recently 
to restart fluoridation. It will take two years to get the plants up and running. So there'll be another couple of years of people suffering, going to the hospital to be treated, living in pain. It's awful. But we are thrilled that Edmonton continued. And that is a trend that we're starting to see in Canada is fluoridation of areas that were not and refluoridation of areas that have stopped. There are four other studies like this out now, and they all show the same things. Next, please. One final slide on it. Next. Let's look at the impact of fluoridation when it's stopped on early childhood caries or when, when you start it. Next, please. Fluoridation's impact on early childhood caries, which is this beautiful picture to your right, it will cause, it will result in a 65 to 77% drop in kids needing to go to the operating room and undergo general anesthesia just to treat early childhood caries. Just starting fluoridation. That means that water operations folks are preventing a boatload of kids having to go to hospitals and having as much decay by simply fluoridating the water. The previous uh, CDC National Fluoridation Engineers said, look, Water operators preventing more cavities than all of us in our field can in dentistry our entire lifetimes. And that doesn't hurt my feelings. That thrills me because not most, as you know, over half the people in this country don't see a dentist on an annual basis. So this is something that is passive. They use toothpaste with fluoride. They, they're additive and they both work to help prevent this. Next slide, please. This child. Unfortunately, this is what they look post-treatment. There were very few savable teeth. And, the, uh, and I do realize that one of the picture on the bottom right, I had to flip it around now. Sorry, you guys, I'll send you the update. It was backwards. But this child looking this way is not going to not see social in interactions at school when they become around five, six, seven years old that people start calling them metal mouth. You've also created a dental cripple that can't eat well, that's got a missing molar on the bottom right and a drifting molar behind it causing orthodontic problems. It's set up, this child has been set up for a lot of issues where fluoridation could help knock this out. It's not gonna knock all the cavities out. What it does is it prevents them from it progressing so rapidly that now these kids are able to be seen in a dental office and are more behaviorally able to sit still and get the work done in a dental setting. That is the preferred method than taking them and putting them, as the folks up in Calgary said when I testified, these anesthesiologist residents, we're taking them near death and we're bringing them back. And for what? For their teeth, that's ridiculous. Next, please. These are the stages of early childhood caries. I just wanted to quickly show, as we've seen all of us see this, uh, on the top left, if you look near the gum line, you'll see some little white lines. That's where the plaque sits. That's where the areas of enamel begin to demineralize from that plaque. And that's the early stages. It progresses to where we get frank cavitation, breaking in of those weakened areas of enamel. And then we end up like in the third picture with teeth that are rotted to the gum line. And those are abscesses pushing them way out. Thank, thank God, God has designed children's mouths in such a way that they will blow abscesses without a lot of pain typically. Not the same for us as adults. The fourth picture on the bottom left is where those teeth are totally eroded to the gum line in the front. Plus you can see all the brown spots on the back teeth. And on the right side is like someone who's had their teeth restored with stainless steel crowns to try and save them until they fall out at ages 10 to 12, keeping the space there for the premolars to come into. Next, please. Let's look at sources of information on science. I call it scientific fictitious claims. These are claims that if you closed your eyes and I gave this presentation on vaccinations and you just substituted the word vaccination for fluoridation, they are exactly, exactly the same claims. And in fact, the top anti-vaccination group in this country and the top anti-fluoridation group joined forces several years ago and they're married at the hip. They do join forces and do the same exact thing. 
Next. So we got to refute this stuff. We can't just let it sit. Next slide, please. These are just a few of the common claims that are made by opponents. And every one of them is false. Some of the big ones right now that are out there is that it causes IQ deficits, that it's causing ADHD, thyroid issues. Just these are all claims that have been made since, oh, God, 1945. <laughs> uh, there's actually been lawsuits over uh, uh, fluoridation that have been heard in the U.S. courts. There have been 108 lawsuits to try and get fluoride to be uh, claimed to be illegal. And in 108 cases in the courts of last resort, they have never deemed it to be a illegal process, something of forced med mass medication. It's not a medication. It's not an infringement upon your, your rights. Basically, the courts say the water company brings the water to your tap. tap. When you turn it on up, you mix it with Kool-Aid, you mix it with spaghetti to spoil it, or you put your uh, favorite libation of the day, mix it. That's your choice. That's where your choice begins. Next, please. So here's some wonderful hyperlinks for you to get to, to refute false claims. The first one is the CDC's water information uh, website. It's great information. The CDC is a governmental agency. They can't say that fluoridation uh, opponents are wax. They can't say anything that is politically could be interpreted as them weighing in on a political side because they're governmental. Personally, on a private sector side, like I am, like many of you are, we can say, we can call a spade a spade. We can say, look, that information is totally wrong. And here's why. And we need to get fluoridation in our water. What that is, is that's actually saying, we want you to vote for it. That's a political statement that's considered advocacy. We in our group are 501c4, and we have a certain amount of advocacy that we can do within IRS rules. And we do it. We mainly are educating, but we all stand up and say, please vote to retain this. Please vote to initiate fluoridation for the health and well-being and livelihood of your families. So our website is going to be beating up on the information that's out there, as well as giving scientific studies that are recently out a summary of those studies and hyperlinks to them. We are also, you can contact us anytime. I've even put my cell phone on here. Um, that's truly the only cell phone I have. I use it all the time in presenting against the top opponents in this country, going on uh, boots on the ground if need be, invited into city council meetings. No one's ever bothered me. They will hassle me in other ways. Social media have had threats made on me, but you know what? When you stand for something, you stand against something. You're not going to hurt our kids and families. Not allowed. So these, we do refute common claims. Uh, we have frequently asked questions as well as the latest studies. American Dental Association has wonderful resources. I will say that right now the American Dental Association is undergoing a total rehaul and many of their links are broken. So the fluoridation facts, which is a great uh, booklet that has the common claims in this booklet uh, that are made against fluoridation, and it has the science that backs up why that claim is incorrect, and that is excellent. Right now, you can't get to it, except if you click that hyperlink, they've, asked, they've allowed us to have it posted on our website. So that will take you to our website, to the book right away. It's totally downloadable. You can use the pages of it and send it to someone that has questions on something. Their mouth healthy link, I did check these, and that is still working properly. Also, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a wonderful, wonderful website, Campaign for Dental Health, which is all about fluoridation. American Academy of Pediatrics has come out strong on fluoridation, and they know how healthy it makes our kids and how that affects the rest of their bodies. God bless them. Next slide, please. I wish I had more time to go over this, but I will tell you that there is a paper that was a product of the American Fluoridation Society and British Fluoridation Society that we modeled ourselves after. They have been around almost over 50 years now. Only about 10% of England is fluoridated. Pretty sad. 
they haven't had a fluoridation initiation in over 40 years. They are now seeing their country move the decision making away from local communities to basically their equivalent of our health and human services. They are going to fluoridate the entire of England. That's how important fluoridation is to the oral health and well being of the general health of the body. We put this piece together because one of the things, if you're like me, when I got out of school, didn't take long before I quit looking at all the points in the study, I started reading the abstract. Abstracts are not very well written. There is a lot of statistical information in it, and there's no th rule of thumb of how to write one. Well, we put this paper together with nine key suggestions for how to assess a research paper, and it is written for us as professionals. It's written for educators. It's kind, it kind of says it's written for people who are uh, as a guide for the non-expert. And that I would put, put myself in that same category because I have to go back and look at things and decipher them and see what's good about them. Did they have 200 people in this study? Did they have 15? How long was it going for? All of these things make a difference in what their conclusions reach and how reliable that study is and valid and is it clinically applicable? Now, in this paper, we go through a more recent one that was published in JAMA Peds on IQ from fluoridated water in Canada. And the authors had it published in JAMA Peds and it is, has been discredited worldwide because of their data. They will not show their data for, a, for independent analysis, which is a common thing to do. Um, we paid for it, NIH paid for it, and they won't release the data to us. We're not happy. So we did an analysis of their paper. And then we also include a spoof paper at the end of it. And the spoof paper is one that goes through a lot of information about how uh, diet and other things that it can affect a, a health, healthy body. And you get to pick out what's wrong with it. And it, it walks you through how to do it. So this is something that I highly recommend that you, that you read, highly read, all of us. And I do. I love it. Next, please. This clinical case number two, and I want to try and get through this pretty quickly. Now, what I want to know, want you to know is how to find out where, how much fluoride you have in water and where you are fluoridated, how you find out what the amount of fluoride is in your water. Next, please. When we have fluoridation, we have community water fluoridation, we assume that we're fluoridated at 0.7. Don't assume it. You can't because it's being put in by water operators that are regulating it as closely as they can. But there are a lot of water operators who do not agree with water fluoridation and they will under fluoridate it. So here's a website by the CDC. It's a, a public facing website called My Water's Fluoride. On the left is the homepage picture of it. It has all the states. You can click on your state. When you do, it will bring up the right side of the picture, which is your, your counties by, in, within the state. So you can click on your particular county and look at your city and see if it's fluoridated or not and at what level. Next slide, please. Those hyperlinks that I have take you directly to those points. You don't have to go search on this, on this website. You can, feel free to, but you can get easily lost. So I'm trying to make this easy for you. Now, the average fluoride levels per month, how much is actually being put in the water by month is reported to the state, to the DEQ at the state level. And Sherry Kiefer at the Oral Health Program has access to this so that they can see how much fluoride is being added in what community. And let me get closer to the, to the screen. If you look at the 0.7 is where we're supposed to be. There is a operational range that plants can have that is 0.6 to 1.0 is what it's being set at by the CDC. And the easiest way to say what an operational range is, it's like you driving your car on the interstate, trying to do 70 miles an hour. Don't use the, don't use the cruise control because the water plant doesn't have a cruise control. You start up a hill, you may go down to 60 miles an hour, but you're trying to keep it there. You go down the hill steep when you may get up to 100 miles an hour. 
hopefully with no one else around, hopefully you don't get hurt, but that's the operating range, 6.6 parts per million to one part per million. So that's why they have an operational range. If you go down to the, if you look at the first one, average annual, they had an average of 0.64, but during the year, it fluctuated. It got below 0.6. The second one, Williston, had 0.5, 0.45, 0.5. Four seven six two, average of 0.59. There will be some that will be way low. Now, who is monitoring this? It's being monitored. The health department can't really reach out and say, you know, what's going on? They can go and inspect the place. They can, DEQ can go and say, well, what's going on? You know, your readings are not the same as what we're getting on your water. It's incumbent upon the private sector, us, to work with the oral health department, the dental association and others to make sure that this is right. If this is your community and it's under fluoridated. You don't want your kids to have cavities growing up because they're not getting the right amount of fluoride. That's not appropriate. Next, please. Now you'll live in areas that are not with community fluoridation. It's not fluoridated water. But you have natural fluoride in levels in water. As I said, the water comes up in the aquifer, erodes rocks. We will have, in the U.S., we have anywhere from zero parts per million all the way up to 20 parts per million in our water. You're not supposed to drink it if it's over four parts per million. That's what the EPA sets as the maximum. What you're getting in your water at 0.7 parts per million is one-sixth of that. So the EPA says that level at four parts per million is where you do not expect any health issues and the margin of safety is adequate. At two parts per million, to pour four parts per million, severe dental fluorosis occurs, the brown staining pits on the teeth. They do consider that as the last time in 2006 when they met this group, that that is a health issue because you could get more cavities. So at two parts per million, that again is three times what it is in your water. There's no other health issues whatsoever. So I put it, pointed to the uh, last slide in the upper left corner where you want to go to to see these reports, the, the state fluoridation reports. This one is the natural systems report. If you look here in this natural systems report, you actually can see just this is just a few of them. This is not the entire list. You can see that you have from 0.63 to 1.95, you've actually got some communities that have 2.0. Now, you don't think your community is fluoridated. There is a big problem, and we, we saw it back in 2015 when the report came out that our level is going to be equal across the U.S. 20% of fluoride supplements are, in, are prescribed inappropriately because we think that we're in an area that doesn't have it, and we're fluoridating, we're prescribing supplements, and we actually are in an area that's fluoridating, or we're in an area that has levels of fluoridated water that are naturally at the level they should be. So we're doubling it up. And those kids can start seeing some stains that are getting close to the brown stains on their teeth. Again, not hurting them, but we don't want to cause discoloration of teeth. The, the maximum cavity reductions and the least amount of mild to very mild fluorosis, which is a little white speck on the teeth, is the sweet spot that we shoot for. And that's at 0.7 parts per million. So when you click on this, I have to admit that I'm working with the CDC on this. Uh, you get to, when you're doing this stuff, you get to be friends with folks in oral health division. This site is not exactly the same as the site that they have, which is called Water Fluoridation Reporting System. They're going to upgrade this on their next, low, next point uh, where it says the level that you can find is 0.6 parts per million and above. They need to take it down to 0.3 to point parts per million as a minimum that you can see. And the reason for that on the next slide is that in between, next slide, sorry. In between 0.3 to 0.6 parts per million, that's where we have to consider giving supplements to children to help them to, get fluoride developing into their permanent teeth that are underneath the gums and into their enamel to make the teeth stronger from the inside out. That is fluoride getting to their teeth systemically. Fluoridated water makes that happen very easily. 
those tablets will give a similar result, but we have to give the appropriate amounts. And again, if you have the level at 0.3 to, and above on that last slide, then you know, hey, in, in uh, this area, this community in Fargo, we have fluoride in our water at 0.4 parts per million. Then you would go to this slide and say, okay, how old is a child? How much should I be giving them as a supplement? There's a lot of other sources, other things to consider, which I won't go into right now, but that's the biggie. And we're getting that fixed so that you all will have adequate data that shows exactly what we wanted to show. Next, please. Please write down your questions because I do want to shoot these quickly with you. Here's what you have to do. This is not an ask, this is a have to. Chair side chats. We can inoculate a community just like those that oppose immunizations and fluoridation inoculate a community against them. They use social media, but people trust us. When they're in our chairs, we have a captive audience. Our hands are in their mouths, especially with dental hygiene. We are talking to them 20 minutes. We need to let them know that, you know, fluoride is very good for our teeth. You're using a toothpaste with fluoride in it. A lot of people don't know. 95% of the toothpaste on the markets have fluoride in it. But the biggest names and biggest things they show on the tubes, it's whitening, fights cavities. It's doing, it removes stains. It helps to make your gums better. And fluoride's gotten to be a real small piece written on it. You almost have to look at what's in it to see it. But 95% have fluoride on the uh, fluoride in the toothpaste on the shelves. If your community is not fluoridated, discuss with that patient what they're experiencing, like those white spots on that child that I showed you. We've all seen those. Those are called white spot lesions or early cavities, decalcifications. Those spots, when you show them, say, you know, these spots here that you're having on your teeth. Okay, dental hygienists are not supposed to make diagnoses. Let me just say that. That said, my staff, I always said, you look and you tell me what you see. You're with the patient longer than I am. You tell me, Dr. Johnny, when I sit down, you say, Dr. Johnny, would you check out tooth number 14 on the distal buckle? Thank you, because we're with the patients for much less time. And I'm going to be honest and tell you that there are a few times that I can miss things and I don't want to miss anything, but you can point it out to me. You know what's going on. You're trained extensively. I have patients that went on a dental school that shadowed me that could read x-rays as well as I could and point out areas to me. What do you think about number 13 on the distal? Well, that's pretty good. Digital films. I love that. So have conversations with them. You know, if we had fluoridated water, you would have less of these areas and our teeth would be in much better shape. You wouldn't have as many cavities. That's a 30 second conversation to a captive audience. You're starting to let them know that when fluoridation comes up, this is something that you're going to be positive on because now they've heard about it from their trusted source. I'm sorry, my ear pods trying to leave me here. You, they've heard about it from a trusted source, you. And that physicians and dentists are some of the most trusted sources in the world. If not one and two, it's always flipping two and three. Pediatricians are at the top. If you have fluoridated water and your patient's sitting in the chair, and you bring you praise, you go, you know, your teeth are in great shape. You have very few cavities. You don't have places on your teeth that are cavities starting, or you may have a few. Fluoridation won't stop all of it, but it makes it where the cavities are not nearly as extensive or nearly as many of them as there would be in non-fluoridated areas. So and reinforce it when you have it. You have it. Trust me, we had it in our county. And when we lost it, thank God it was only a year because changes during the year's time was not going to happen. But in, in Calgary, in three years' time, they had 169% increase in cavities in these second graders in just that little bit amount of time. That's how long it takes before anything starts to show up. And that's horrific. No, we don't exist to let a disease that's infectious and transmissible go unaccounted for. We wouldn't just ignore periodontal disease and say, you know what, I can do more, get more perio surgery, my periodontist to be happy. Let's just kind of say, you know what, you got eight, nine millimeter pockets. Uh, 
you know, go home, brush better. No, we're educating the dickens out of them. We're doing anything we can to help those pockets and those areas to have better treatment, putting med medicaments in those areas. This is the same thing. We don't take water fluoridation for granted. Now, if they're on well water, that well water needs to be checked because again, these wells have a lot of fluoride in them and wells are used in communities that have fluoridate, that have um, community water systems. And again, it can have a little or it can have too much. People assume that they're on a well, I don't have fluoride in my water. Totally untrue, totally. And we have to ask, are you, where do you get your water from? It's from a well. Okay, bring your sample in. There's a way to do that. Um, I'm not going to say Jim uh, Kershaw and Bismarck should be the one to do this for you, but your water plant can, can then, uh, do an analysis on it, and they will tell you, give it to me in a plastic bottle and not glass. Glass has fluoride in it and would leach into the water. We want an accurate analysis, and then they will send you the results. Then you can know whether you need to put someone on a fluoride supplement or put them on a, a, a concentrated 5,000 part per million uh, uh, paste at nighttime, not children, but the adults, but you can do other things to help, but you need to work to keep them fluoridated and take it up to a hundred percent. Like Flint happen if the water is so closely monitored. Okay. Let me explain Flint. <laughs> Flint was in a dire financial straits. They got their water from Detroit, Michigan. Detroit was taking good care of their water and they had fluoride in it. Now, the government, state government took over in Flint because they were on financial bankruptcy. And they said, well, we're going to try to cut your cost. We're going to go on the Flint River and change our water supply. They no longer had fluoride at that point. Now, the issue is, and I know folks in, in Michigan that are in the water industry and they can't talk about this to them. They say the F word is off limits. And that's truly what they say. What happened was the Flint River is very caustic, meaning that it's in an acidic situation. What happened in Flint was that water did not get buffered to where it was near seven, a pH of seven. So as that water began to go through those pipes, pipes have a inside of it for a purpose. Water is the most, uh, it's the most solvent of any solvents that we have. It will just dissolve the wave. That corrosion layer of, of sand and other things that are on in that pipe get pulled into the water. Now that water is able to go through that pipe. And what it did was in terminal connections in homes that had copying and in soldering, solder has fluoride in it and, and lead. And what happened was it began that acidic water began to eat away and cause a lead issue. Um, it went on way, way too long. Now, they, uh, to my knowledge, and said what happened, but we all know what happened. It was invested heavily by the University of Virginia. Said hey, we're us included. That's what happened. That's a horrific situation. But that say fluoridated water caused it. Well, guess what? The water was not fluoridated, it was acidic. And they immediately they went right back on Detroit's water when they found out what was going on. A pediatrician was the one that said, something's happening. My kids are having lead in their lead in their uh, systems. And Who is the best person on your dental team to start these conversations with our dental patients? Should this be something the dental assistant does, the dental hygienist or the dentist? Um, and when in the care practice is the best time to start having that conversation with the patient? When our fingers are in their mouths. Uh, and in Florida, we have uh, dental assistants that some states have them that are called expanded functions. They can do polishing of teeth. They can do a lot of things that the hygienist can do, dental hygienist can do. They have that conversation with the patients. Now, again, they know what cavities look like. They know what early cavities look like. And they're, they're not going to diagnose, but they're going to say these areas here are problematic areas that are going to start to weaken and break down as they're turning from white spots, which is enamel that has had the mineral leached out of it. Dental hygienist also. We, as dentists coming in, I mean, 
It may be two, three, or four minutes, and we're going to be talking about what the issues are. Yeah, it would be good for us to talk about it too, but other people have brains and can do this. Somebody said to me a long time ago, hey, guess what? Your staff has a family at home and they manage the checkbook and they can run an entire business. It's like, oh, I, I believe it. So I empowered my staff to do that. And just as long as they don't take it up to the step of saying to the parent, well, they've got this, this, and this, and they're not going to get in trouble. No, it's absolutely the best when the child is listening and you can bring a parent back or your parent, the adults are in the chair and you're talking to them. Those conversations are great to have. That's right when it should happen. So a follow-up question to that is mm -hmm. in dental settings and in medical settings, oftentimes providers, whether it's this, you know, the CNA or the dental assistant or the dental hygienist, they ask questions of the patient when they come in, a change of address, you know, simple, simple questions. Is your recommendation that a question be asked or could it be asked about whether or not individuals are drinking bottled water or tap water or are aware of fluoride in their water? If you all will contact me, I have a form that I used in my office that is very extensive, but they fill it out before they come in. And it goes over whether they are uh, drinking bottled water, what brand, and that way we will be able to know because we had a book full of information that we kept handy that had fluoride in the water. There's one of them in particular, Arrowhead, has 1.4 parts per million in it. And it's just not on the bottle, it's twice what fluoridated water is. So we ask those questions. We ask where they're going to school, where they live, are they at home, uh, split homes, because those issues all figure into. And I said there's more to it than just uh, where you live and uh, what you're drinking. It's because we live in a society that divorces are very high. Uh, grandparents and daycare folks may be, may be taking care of the kids. So they're getting, in, they may be in an area that doesn't have fluoride at home, fluoridated water, but then they go to school in a fluoridated area. All of that is in this form that I have, and I will be happy to share it. And it takes a lot of guesswork. Then on your checkup appointments, you just have to ask a few questions to update that information. So you know where people are going. And if they do get fluoride prescription needs, then you know how to give it. And it can be convoluted. Water fluoridation, right? But I know you have a past of being, you know, a practitioner. So just wondering if you have any insights, because of course there's a lot of different studies out there and, you know, whatever you're looking for, you can usually find something to back up, um, you know, your thoughts, depending on which way you're looking for something. Mm -hmm. um, but do you have um, any particular um, feedback about fluoride varnish versus foam? Um, so we know that there's some providers in the state that still use the foam trays mm -hmm. for varnish. Mm -hmm. um, and from the things that I've read, you know, the effectiveness is, um, is, is higher in a varnish than a foam. Um, and the efficacy is much lower on a foam. Um, the ease of use by provider and patient is obviously um, better with a varnish. So do you know um, maybe what reasons or what kind of... Um, persuasion that we could use with providers that are still doing foam. I'm not sure if it's maybe a cost savings that um, with it, but you know, it takes longer to also apply the foam too. So not right, sure if you have right. any insight on, on those two pieces of fluoride. Well, I do. And it's uh, from the American uh, Association of State and Territorial Dental Directors. They have done a, a evaluation of the literature as others have, and the varnishes are highly recommended. Uh, foams, you still, even though they call them a one minute foam, they're supposed to be on the teeth for four minutes. It is a, yes, I used foam until varnishes came out. Or I used gels before that. Varnishes are much easier to apply. They adhere to the teeth better and they're lasting a longer time on the teeth before the kids can brush them off. So yes, varnishes are, I'll go out on a limb from my memory and say they're more effective they certainly are easier to apply. I saw one clinician in a mission to mercy that just put it on his finger and rubbed it onto the teeth all the way around, didn't paint it on with a brush. Now I thought, how simple is that? You can quickly get it on the teeth, just like you would with a 5,000 part per million uh, Prevident. So easy to do. But yeah, I can, if you wanted to contact me, I can get you the stats on that, definitely. And it's all this stuff that when you look at it this way, like you said, you look for the peer reviewed information. You can get articles that are out there and that have not been published in peer reviewed uh, um, evidence-based 